Selina Thomas was currently on her roof in the cooling evening air. She was clad in a new purple sports bra that worked remarkably well and matching purple athletic shorts. The prosthetics she was wearing were her nice simskin ones, with remote access plugs inserted into their data ports. A headband held a bizarre optical interface securely to her head, feeding her a simulated optical data and her hair was pulled into a ponytail to keep it away from her face. Her laptop was running a very demanding program, relaying data and instructions to the remote access plugs attached to her prosthetics, as well as an aftermarket drone array system. Another aftermarket cooling system was keeping the laptop running near maximum capability at safe temperature levels. Gerd watched her friend move quickly, ducking and dodging invisible opponents, perspiration beading on her actual skin from exertion. Gerd was still remarkably sore and hurt, more so now with the waning light of what proves gloriously blue star. However, such a thing as pain was overshadowed by the graceful form of Selena Torres as she progressed through the sim program the latter was running. Simulated data had been streaming in real time to each of the remote access diagnostic plugs attached to her friend's prosthetics, even her eye. Looking at the laptop screen revealed a third person view of Selena fighting many fictional beings in hand to hand combat in a kind of open research like facility. Whereas most gaming simulation systems allowed a certain amount of disbelief into their gameplay, such as unlimited item space, strange powers or abilities, or even decelerated time to change up active armaments or powers, whatever monstrosity was loaded up allowed no such thing. The modifications made to the programs gave an unprecedented sense of immersion, allowing Selena to climb, run and jump, even while staying within the confines of her roof due to the game data being sent directly into her prosthetic systems. What sensory data manipulation could not accomplish, a newly purchased and expensive drone array system capable of generating small-scale shaped energy fields finished. It allowed Selena to hang on things, walk upstairs or stand on boulders. Looking through the new special smart glasses linked to the laptop, Gerd could see how everything was rendered in real time. Selena was hastily loading up a weapon of some unknown design, single shells at a time. They gave up on loading the weapon, going on the defensive immediately, and firing everything currently loaded in it, not even bothering to aim the energy flechettes. Throwing the emptied weapon at the fictional creatures, Selena got into a ready combat stance, deflecting his thick, meaty fist out of the way, the dummy plugs attached to all of her prosthetics relaying synthetic sensory data, as though she really had done just that. Come get me, she shouted to the simulated demonic thing in front of her. The program running had been originally designed for full VR use by Terrence, however, Extensive modifications allowed the sim game to run in true real time for training purposes. The monster grabbed Selena's left arm, its huge hulking form easily dwarfing her. It then plunged its claws into her belly and pulled everything out, killing her for the eighth time in a row, as the drone system applied a gentle pressure to her stomach, simulating the attack. At least she got it down into the red this run. Game over. It was the last thing Selena saw before the simulation reset, ready for her to try again awaiting her commands. Ugh, that sucked, Selena said, as she dabbled over to her chair next to Gerd, pouring the remainder of the black spindle lemonade she was getting better and better at making. You're getting better, Gerd said, looking her friend over, imagination and eyes wandering, not even bothering to hide her desire. Yes, I know that, Selena said in an exasperated tone, draining the liquid she had poured. It doesn't make it any easier. You did pretty well with those, uh... Proton swords? Everyone does well with proton swords, Selena said dismissively. I'm trying not to use weapons and go full hand to hand. You felt that around sequence four, I think, Gerd reminded. No, proton swords are required for that encounter and level, so using them doesn't count. Ooh, was the only thing Gerd could respond with. Yeah, Selena said, agreeing. Doom 5055 hardcore real time life mods are a bitch. I thought you were running a true sim, not a modded sim. Oh no, Selena said. This is a totally modified sim game. The changes include time-based reactions and real-world carrying capacity, weapon selections and healing, amongst other things. Is that why you try to use that uh, medpack MX in that designated uh, safe space? Exactly, Selena said, stretching. I should have been doing this before, especially when I knew I was being targeted. Anyways, I'm running this sim at maximum difficulty with my full data profile, so I'll need the repair stations as well as medical stations or repair kits and medkits in sim, which are sparingly given. 
The sim is quite adaptive in that regard. Remind me not to play that. Hardcore real-time and life mods adjust the difficulty in other settings by species and personal ability. It gets more adaptive if you can upload gym membership information or the like. I'll keep that in mind, Gerd said. At any rate, hardcore real-time and life mods are supposed to be challenging to the point of absurdity, leading teams of 3 to 7 to be properly. I'm using this sim as a training and observation thing, at least until I can get something better. Well, you can observe me, Gerd said with a small smile. Gerd, honey, I've told you, Selina said, a bit of a southern drawl seeping into the translator matrix once. I'll help you out and make it worth your while after you've had some time to heal up. I'm not going to take you back to the hospital because I made you spaz out and tear up your stitching. Gerd made a frustrated, groaning, needy sound. The doctor and I keep telling you that you need some time to heal before you can engage in any kind of sexy time, and I've told you that as long as you don't go back to the hospital from you trying to satisfy yourself or whatever, I'd be yours to command on my next off period. You do want to command me, don't you? Gerd let out another noise of needy frustration. Come on, let's get you downstairs. I'm hungry and I think I've got the hang of making frogrul, Selina said, taking off the headband and optical data plug, then inserted her prosthetic eye, using eye drops as she did so then began to pack away everything into a side bag. After some manoeuvring, Gerd let Selina help her up onto her feet, and couldn't help but state the obvious. No amount of training or experience will help you make that. You're utterly hopeless. As they walked downstairs to Selina's kitchen, slowly, Selina said, Is that so? Well, you'll just have to endure my attempt at it. No, Gerd said, overdramatically. Anything but that. They both laughed until Gur suddenly stopped, holding her side. Ow, oh, was all she managed to say softly, not moving on the stairs as she recovered. Those mess they gave you really suck, huh? Selina asked. Yeah, they do. Anything I can do to help that? I mean, really, I know I've got some good contraband. I don't know what'll work for you, though. No, I don't think so, Gur said with a sigh, regaining her composure, then asked, M Maybe, um, do you still have that chocolate of yours? Yeah, I've got two parts left. I'm trying to get more, though, Selina answered, as the two of them entered the kitchen and adjoining dining area. I thought you didn't like how it made you feel. I don't, Gerd admitted, as she eased herself into a chair slowly, sighing and confessed. But it's so hard to sleep. My breasts put too much pressure on my broken connections plates, and I can't lay sideways or on my belly. The sunlight helps by causing my chromatophores to release endomorphins and other hormones. But that just leaves me feeling so horny, and photogasms can only help so much, especially because I'm so young and fertile for my people. I want sexual release and sleep so fucking badly, but I'll settle for some goddamn rest over getting off. I'm so miserable in all the worst ways. Ugh. You poor girl, Selina said, and tried to make a joke. At least your breasts aren't as big as mine. You'd be in far more pain. Oh, ha ha, Gerd said, trying to find a comfortable position. My tears could be three times the size of yours, they wouldn't compare to the abomination of what you try to pass off as Frorobru. It's not that bad, and I'm learning okay, Selina said. Excuse me if I fuck it up. Fucking it up would be better than what you made last time, Gerd said. In fact, I prefer a fucked up Frorobru dish than that burnt sludge you've been trying to peddle me. I think it's worse for my palate than my tits are to my broken connection plate and rips. Now that's just plain mean. I'm a cruel mistress, just ask Klein. I didn't need to know that. The two of them both shared a chuckle. Okay, Selina said. Do you think you can teach me to make frog fruit better than I have been? I've got all the ingredients. Sure, just... Let's get me that chocolate first, okay? What followed was a cooking lesson provided by Gerd. And as Selina listened and followed the directions provided by her friend, the meal slowly took shape. It was a common dish served on sprout, Fermented and marinated thick cuts of cued meat, cooked at a low temperature with fermented plant matter which varied by season. The fermented juices were heavy in citrus, sugar and some kind of native salty brine made from ocean water, along with a handful of odd herbs, spices and differing coloured salts. The meal had originated from some kind of celebration, but had become far more commonplace as technology and agricultural techniques allow for easier harvesting and growing of the ingredients. Slowly turning up the temperature on the electric range, Selina cooked out the moisture without turning the meal into too much sludge. It was the best she had made since Gerd had decided to recover at her home, rather than the apartment she rented out on the west side. The meal was supposed to serve five sproulings. However, 
It proved to be just enough for the two friends. Their shared meal went well, and they talked about inconsequential things. About love and life, or family and friends, monetary woes, past lovers and flings, regrets and motifs, as well as many other things that cropped up during their conversation. The chocolate that Gerda had eaten earlier was affecting her in subtle ways, as the green woman was far more open with her personal life, as well as moving about much more freely, and not as slowly as before. With their shared meal done, and another chocolate rectangle consumed by Gerd, Selina put everything away, meaning to do the dishes later, as she still had other things to do downstairs in her workspace. Walking with Gerd to her bedroom, she looked to her slightly loopy friend. You okay there, girl? Hmm? Oh, yes, Gerd said. You were right, that is good chocolate. Much better than what I had before that one time. Okay, let's get you in bed, alright? Jenny does it, Selina said. As she helped her friend get into her actual bed in her room, then stripped her friend out of what little clothes she had on. Selina looked at the fresh stitches and gird, and couldn't help but feel responsible for the dire wound that had nearly claimed her friend's life. It was expertly patched up, but would leave a long and thin jagged scar on her waif and slender body. Perhaps one day she could forgive herself, but today was not that day. I'm sorry, Gerd, for everything that's happened to you, Selina said to the older woman. Mm, is nothing, Gerd replied, laying down slowly. You're not the one that tried to kill me, so you have nothing to say sorry for. Yeah, you're right, again, Selina said. You get some rest, okay? I think that second piece of chocolate is already hitting you. It is, Gerd said, then asked. Can you stay with me? I don't want to be alone right now. Sure, Selina said. I'll stay with you. Thanks, Gerd said sleepily. You're a great friend, you know that. You'll let me do so much with you, and you've never asked for anything in return. You've put up with me when you didn't have to, and I know I've been a jerk sometimes, and just... Thanks. It's what friends do, you know. Yeah, it's what friends do, Gerd said, holding Selina's hand as she fell asleep, her breathing easy for the moment. It's what friends do. The soul Terran whispered after some time had passed. Selina stayed with Gerd until she was sure her friend was firmly asleep, and then a little while longer, a smile on her face. Rutak felt like an unseriously dropped sack of excrement that was set on fire on a doorstep and then stomped out, nothing more than a tired juvenile prank of little creativity nor value. He could endure the spiderweb of fractures and broken bones up with his ribs, and other connected structures. He could tolerate the pain from the lump of swollen flesh that had the audacity to call itself a claw. He could even manage the internal thrashing brought on by sprouting hemotoxic pheromones. What he could not do was endure all three all at once. Due to the damage to his hematopoiesis capabilities from the sprouting hemotoxin, he could not be prescribed any kind of pain medication, and had been strongly advised not to intake any foreign substances, lest he go into blood shock and run a high chance of a very slow and painful death. He knew his doctor was right. He could feel that something was... off in his body. Time would heal such internal damage. It was not the first time he had endured sprouting chemical wrath. He still did not want to do it again. As a result, he sent his best friend, Ornok, lots of money, and demanded he buy them both as many high-quality skewers as possible, and whatever else seemed good. Cost, calories, and authenticity be damned. If he was going to be miserable, he was going to be miserable with good food and good company. While he waited for Ornok, he turned on his very high-end holo projector and put on something nostalgic. The film he had settled on was a Terran film, the first that ever became nominated to win a Galactic Alliance Film Festival Award, shortly after Terran first contact. While it did not win the category of Best Effects, it was still groundbreaking in that very little was generated by the computer. Makeup, costumes, robotics, puppetry, pyrotechnics, cinematography. The entirety of it was done without any real computer aid, unlike most films. The production itself simply challenged long-held industry beliefs. The film, Knowings, had been what Terrence called an urban fantasy, and, while on the longer side, told the story of a prodigal magician from modern times, seeking out a powerful prophet that had been captured by evil spirits and mages. The whole thing was quite suspenseful, and the action scenes were amazing. From gouts of fire, electrical discharges, wheeled ground vehicle combat, and bizarre shape-changing, 
Rutek had quite the difficulty in believing that there was little done in the way of computer-generated imagery. Knowings, however, did inspire a whole slew of production companies to try to minimise CGI in their films. It was one of the greatest cultural contributions Terrans had ever given to the wider galaxy. Such practices were still in use. Midway through the film, Rutek heard a knock at the door. Oi, let me in, he heard Ornok shouting through the door. Open it yourself, it's unlocked, Rutak shouted back to immediate regret, wincing and holding his sides. The door opened after some struggle and Ornok walked in carrying bags of good food that filled the small apartment with their aroma. I got us the good stuff, Ornok said. I pay for half, but don't worry about that. Let me get us some plates. You didn't need to do that, Rutak said. Oh, I did have to do that, Ornok said with a grin. I remembered what you told me, so I got us the good skewers and other great stuff directly from a Zipluor's butchery. That's a really nice and fancy one off 28th and Prungnik. Hell, there's still fresh blood in them. I was old, baby. Well worth the price. No way! Way, Ornok said with a wide grin. Or a parcel one with their species, serving them both up. Pulling up the expertly lightly seared skewers, still oozing blood onto their plates. What are you watching? He asked as he sat down, offering a plate to his friend. Sorry if they're a little cold, it was a bit of a drive. That old Terran film, Knowings, Rutak answered, taking a bit off the skewer. Oh, that's good. Real good. It was like I hunted it down myself. Told you I had to throw in half, Orlok replied, still grinning, then changed the subject. That's a good one. Did you know it was a book series first? That film was just the first book. There are four more films. They didn't do well outside of Terran space, though. Hardly acclaimed at any rate. Ha, huh, I wonder why. Lots of cultural differences is the main reason. It was set in Terra Prime, so a lot of things that would make sense to a Terran wouldn't to someone from the Galactic Alliance. That makes a lot of sense. It's still a good film series. I've seen all five. Well, I'm not going anywhere, so I think we have time for a marathon. Sounds good to me. That was shit intel we had. A half-deconstructed Nimeon on an operating table simply stated. We've had bad intel before, an old Mipos countered. Not like this. Heavily modified Terran assassin was the only thing a very tall and very scarred elderly Mipops man said to his friend, speaking each word as a simple statement, currently being rebuilt on a cling table, dismantled but arranged in a certain way. I fought heavy augments before. That bitch was more machine than organic. That's not what our intel was saying, the Mipple said. I have it on good authority that her internals are all organic, apart from her left lung. Which doesn't make sense, the Nimian on the operating table said. She should have had hard limits. I think... I think that's where our intelligence may be wrong, the old man said contemplatively. Terrans can ignore their own limitations, lift, pull or push things that cause their muscles to tear from their bones, or even break and shatter them outright. What's to stop that from happening with cybernetic simulacra? Nothing, a voice said from the door of the operating room, closing it quietly. I mean no trouble to you and yours, contractors. The older Mipops leveled a fully charged heavy pulse rifle for the newcomer by way of greeting, quickly as well. At such close range, a hit was guaranteed, and at the power levels, they were audibly humming through the device. Such a hit would permanently damage organs. It was a most painful way to perish. My quarrel is with that Tuxes operating on your friend there, the Manau Yul, known as Ob Sidin, said. Now this is interesting, the old man said, moving his finger away from the trigger but still within easy reach of it. What do you have against our dear prosthesist? Shitty work, cat corners, inferior materials, my list goes on. You don't say, the older gentleman said in palpable disbelief. It could be why you failed to take down your mark, Ob said. Leaned against the wall without a care in the galaxy. I saw that fight. Many others did too. We know your kitten set up, mostly, into a point. She would have given you trouble, no doubt about it. But after you turned on your reactor, that should have been it. No non-reactor internal power supply should be able to cope with yours. The mathematics simply don't work, and the numbers don't lie. I've been telling you that, the Nimian shouted. Hmm, was all the older man said. Now, I believe that our mutual Tuxis friend has been shitting on us, and everyone else has come to her for work. That's a lie, the Tuxis bellowed out, not looking like from where she was working. And she taught my patients with the respect they deserve. Is that so? I have to politely disagree, Ob said, 
but looked at the Mipops with the weapon levelled at him, if I may. With a nod from the Mipops, Ob reached into a pocket and produced a data cube, which he placed on the counter. Medical records, proof I'm not full of excrement from many medical examiners. Drogoff, are you at a critical juncture? Yes, the Toxis answered, her skin bunched up, signifying nervousness. I can't have my attention. Then we'll have a look at this data cube, the older gentleman said, then turned to Ob. If you're wrong... He left the fret, hang in the air. If I'm wrong, I'll go home, talk to more doctors, hopefully never bother you again, pay you for taking up your time. Any number of things you want, really, Ob said, leaning against the wall with his eyes closed. But if I'm right, his life is gonna suck. What followed after the data cube's profile had been loaded up onto the hollow projector, only confirmed everything that Ob Sidine had said to the two compatriots. As Ob and Six Row perused the data in the hollow projector, the Tuxes in question made a quiet and hasty exit, aided by a prepared hologram and a computer operating program. Once she was certain she had put some distance between herself and the meddlesome Nyal Yil, she input a data string onto a certain application on her phone. As she ran through her pre planned escape route, she heard the detonations of high yield shaped charges. She hoped that the explosions would take care of her loose ends. The director had given her explicit instructions to undermine certain individuals on a long term basis. She hoped that she would be well received by one of his vassals for doing his work for so long. She did not stop running down abandoned maintenance service tunnels for a long time. <laughs>